said Gibbs phase rule. Gibbs phase rule, which uh, is all about degrees of freedom. And remember, so I've got two degrees of freedom, P and T, one, and then nothing at the triple point. I have a little formula that gives me that. <coughs> What's kind of neat about this is uh, this is a proof. It's a proof not like geometry, like sophomore high school geometry, where like you had to prove that all the angles of an object added up to 360, all the internal angles, uh, which makes sense because even a circle has 360 degrees of internal angles. And you can't do it by just drawing a bunch of objects and showing that they're all 360, which is really annoying. You have to do it a completely different way. Um, so, it, you know, a way that's more exact. So what I'm going to do in terms of proof, this is not the perfect exact way. This is not the geometry way. This is just a bunch of examples, and then we come up with a phenomenological formula that we accept as true. Okay, so degrees of freedom are often expressed with the letter F, just because... I don't know, what else are you going to do? So we tend to use the letter F. And we can pretty much automatically say that there's two. Pressure temperature. Real easy, it's the, it's the intensive variable. So, so that's kind of a no-brainer. Now, I just went off on a, a little ramble about how this is an equilibrium phase diagram. Equilibrium is defined by intensive variables. And the P and T are good ones, all right? So I know I've got two. Now, this is where it gets kind of interesting. Um, where do I do it? Here, I'll, I'll, I'll do it right here. So I'm going I'm to express ideas, and I'm going to change my degree for three. That's how I'm going to do this. Let's say that there are C is the number of components. So I'll write that down, number of components. Now, number of components would be, uh, I'm going to do a bunch of examples of ethanol and water, all right, of uh, James Bond's martini which uh, they need a new James Bond. That last movie was, that was awful. I mean, supposedly, even what's his name? Um, Guy Pierce? Was Daniel Craig. Daniel Craig wanted out, and he, he was just like insulting the people who made it, and that's what actors do when they want to get out of their contract, is insult. <laughs> Megan Fox did it on Transformers. She didn't want to be in Transformers anymore. <laughs> so, what? Oh my God, I don't <laughs> I don't remember why I'm talking about Transformers. Uh, or... Um, martinis. Martinis, martinis, right, that's how I got into this. Okay. Now, number of components ought to change the degrees of freedom because I can add, I can make the drink stiff or not, right? I can add more or less alcohol to my cup of water. And, of course, we're going to also talk about adding an ice cube. But anyway, all right, so... What's a little odd is that, and remember I was drawing the face diagram of water. Why am I mucking that up, right? Face diagram of water. We'll also do CO2, because you know that's a weird one, because like dry ice, right? Anyway, why am I talking about mixing this up when it's perfect as is? It's because a lot of chemical reactions, in, if you're doing a chemical reaction, you have more than one thing in the reactor then. You may also have more than one phase. That's actually common. Uh, to the tune of about 80 percent, uh, heterogeneous catalysis, right? The oil industry, they do things with solid ca solid catalysts. Often the substrates are gas or liquids. So, um, because it's relevance to uh, reactions, um, we need to think about the degrees of freedom of, of having more than one component. And I might draw what phase diagrams look like. They obviously are not the same as this. If I have more than one component. I'm not going to emphasize this terribly much, though, for this class. When I do 340, I actually will spend an extra half an hour talking about this because it's actually the class full of engineers. And all they do are chemical reactions. So with you guys, I'm not going to emphasize this. So uh, regardless, uh, yes, if I have more than one thing in, I can control. It's all about degrees of freedom, which are things I can control. I can control the amount of stuff that I put in if I put something in and how much. And now there would also be a certain number of phases. Uh, so, not, sorry, number number of phases. Uh, I'm just writing that. I know it's self-evident, but I'm just writing it out just in case. Okay, so if I add water and ethanol, and imagine that there's an ice cube, um, I, I, I'm not quite sure, but let's just say some of the ethanol would freeze onto the ice cube. I, I don't really know that. I imagine at least some degree. I know ethanol freezes at a much lower temperature. So now I've added a certain amount 
of um, a certain amount of ethanol to the liquid, and that's the same thing as adding a certain amount of ethanol to the ice that's floating in it. So it looks like I've got, I need to add C times P, right? Because every phase will have the same number of components. Um, I, I, I'm pretty sure about that. Even if it's, you know, like I say, with ethanol and water in an ice cube, I imagine that not too much ethanol is in the solid state, but, but there'd be some, all right? Okay, so that, that's fine. Um, you know, again, if I have two things in the liquid and then two things in the solid, then there you go. Um, yeah, we'll look at it in the solid. Now, now, this is where it gets kind of funky. So again, ethanol and water. Let's just do ethanol and water. Let's actually get rid of the ice cube. I don't want to get things too complicated. Let's do ethanol and water in the liquid. So that would be one phase, two. So I have four degrees of freedom, right? Uh, two, one phase, ethanol, water. One, two, three, four. I have four degrees of freedom. Okay, so again, the degrees of freedom are pressure, temperature, so I can warm and cool the solution. It's still uh, of martini. Uh, and I can make it stiff or strong by adding in ethanol. Well, that's only three. Right, you see that? I can, I can again change, forget about pressure, okay? I can change the pressure. Change the temperature, obviously I chill it. I add more or less ethanol, that's three, but my equation says that there's four, right? One, two, three, four. The problem is there's this funny equation that says the mole fraction, and again, I'll stick with ethanol and water because that's easy. Of course, you just gotta imagine that this, this can be whatever. I have this funny equation that says that actually there's a constraint. Right, so remember that if I'm adding more ethanol, I'm simultaneously diluting the water. Then see, that would be the other control. That, that's the part that I'm not, that um, I, I mentioned that I can add as much ethanol. That fourth missing control is the water, but notice I can't control that because they're related. Obviously, if I add more methanol, uh, more ethanol, I am automatically changing the mole fraction of water in a way that I cannot control. I, I've got to basically pick one. Am I going to set the ethanol or am I going to set the water? And, and honestly, those are the same thing anyway. All right, so what happens is, is that when we figure out degrees of freedom, yet we realize that there are constraints, which come in the form of equations with equal signs, then we've overcounted. Now again, we've overcounted, just like I just said, pressure, temperature, and no brainer. I want to mix water and ethanol. I can only pour in the ethanol. That's only one thing I can do, not that the equation says two. So the answer is, is that you have to subtract. You have to sub subtract because I have these constraints. Now I'm just going to figure out what the constraints are. So what I see here, I got to remind myself the answer because uh, I get confused. Um, OK, the way I'm going to do this is I'm going to do this the non-geometry proof type of way. I'm just going to start coming up with equations and with different components in different phases until I figure out how to come up with an equation for the number of equal signs. So uh, the way I'm going to do this again, so I'm going to see I've got A and I've got B, that's water and ethanol. And uh, I'll add something else, a little vermouth. I'll stop there. And uh, these will all be in the in one phase. Now, you might uh, may not remember that when we introduced chemical potential, I mentioned to you that we would use Greek letters for phases. So here you go. OK, so that's the water. Now I've got uh, ice. I've got a little bit of frozen ethanol. I've got a little bit of frozen vermouth. And that would be the beta or ice solid phase. And that would be one. And OK, so right now, I think I can count up the number of equal signs as a function of C and P. And what I'm seeing here is that uh, I, I could write down another equation. So right now, when I, when I talked about the liquid phase, I had an equal sign. It actually didn't seem to matter how much water ethanol removed or salt, if I added salt. That wouldn't affect the result. I could still have one equal sign. Uh, I got another equal sign when I added a phase, right? And that's pretty simple. And again, I could add some uh, grenadine, I could add some salt, and yet I would still have the one equal sign. I just need to, the only thing that mattered was that there's an ice cube. And of course, I guess I should write down one more. If there's a vapor, uh, then I'd have three phases and three equal signs. So the answer is that you overcount it by the number of phases. So there you go. 
Okay, last bit, and then we've got it nailed, is, um, I'll just keep going this way. Okay, so recall that if I'm going to invoke this idea of a martini with an ice cube, then I need to maintain that ice cube, right? The, the whole point is that the system is in equilibrium. And if I'm telling you I've got a martini with an ice cube, that ice cube needs to stay. I can't, I can't uh, perturb that to, until it melts. All right, now I know the definition of equilibrium would be in the case of, here, what will I do? I'll do, let's do the water. And it's a liquid water, okay, liquid water. And that would have to be equal to the chemical potential of the ice cube, right? Okay, so again, I'm just defining equilibrium. I'm just trying to figure out that I have constraints and that my degrees of freedom, my CP, I've overcounted. And so I've come up with this simple one with mole fractions, unfortunately, adding to one. But I've got another one, which is that I can't let the ice melt. That's what, that's what I'm doing now. Oh, let's not forget the vapor. There's a vapor as well. And this is, again, uh, water. I've got the ethanol, and it's in the liquid. Uh, it's in the. Um, oh yeah, 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 yeah. That's right. It's in the liquid form. Uh, there's a little bit of solid ethanol, probably not much, but there's some. There's definitely some vapor. That's what the cop said. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this is why I'm getting fired. Uh, anyway, okay, here's the vermouth. I actually don't know what vermouth is to tell the honest truth. Uh, that's the beta phase, and there's some vapors removed. I think I've had removed one. one. Um, okay, now I've got to come up with a formula for the number of equal signs. I'm going to stop here. Uh, I'm sure I could come up with some more things to add, some grenadine. I could, I could do that. Uh, but I think I've got it down. What I want to do is figure out the number of equal signs. And, um, and it's a little bit more complicated because in this case, it was clear that every time I drew a line, I had an equal sign. But every time I draw a line, I've got a little bit more than one equal sign. All right, so when I'm looking across here, I see that I have three columns, and I've got two equal signs. And these are defined by phase. All right, so every time I added, all right, so when I said that the liquid was in equilibrium with the solid, that was one equal sign. I needed two phases to get one equal sign. And when I had three phases, I had two equal signs. So this is pretty obviously P minus 1. Okay. Now, again, to get the total number of equal signs, I've got to remember that I had to do this for all the different things I threw in the martini. Anyway, the whole point of this is that it's just kind of this neat problem that you can then really walk you through it. So I'll walk yourself through it. And, um, so, again, pressure temperature is a given. Uh, kind of made sense, but reality is we overcounted. We saw that when I started talking about uh, when I started talking about how mole fractions have to add up. When I brought up that adding water to ethanol actually only allows me to control one thing, not two. And now I've got to remember that I can't let the ice cube melt, so I've got to multiply C times P minus one. Okay, and then what we do is we simplify this, and I won't uh, bother you with the details. C. Uh, let me make sure. P minus P minus, okay, yeah. So this ends up being uh, 2 plus C minus P. Okay, so there you go. So let's figure out whether this works. Um, this didn't actually give us what we wanted. Okay, let me just delete this part. Let me look at this, let me look at this part right here. Okay. F is 2 plus, uh, there's one component, this is just a single phase diagram, and there is just one phase, and sure enough, there's two, right? Okay, now this guy, I better get one. There's uh, P and T, there's still just water, but now I've got two phases, and there's only one degree of freedom. And here, uh, P and T, there's still just one thing, but three phases, and sure enough, I can't do anything. That's what this says, so it works. Uh, now, again, recall, um, I'm not sure, I do generally have a test question on this. Uh, usually within 340, which again is half engineers, 
What I then do is I start giving examples of reactive systems where you have different phases present, you know, like a catalyst, like a heterogeneous catalyst, and why the, the relevance there is that if you need to maintain all your phases for your reaction to, to, to go, you have to be careful. Again, think like an engineer, um, and this is why this stuff exists. Think like an engineer, you have all these different things in the pot, they need to react, and so you need to have some degree of stability, so you need to know what you can and can't adjust. This is what walks you through that. Um, I find that, I just don't think that's appropriate for this class, so what I'm gonna do is just skip over it and just simply not do it. And instead, focus on, um, so I don't know what I'll have on the test on this, I'm sure I'll come up with something, a true and false question. Instead, what I wanna do next is, now that I've defined the general structure, I've shown you that there are planes, lines, and points in the phase diagram, and how to quantify the object's phase rule, what I'm going to do now is say, give you a triple point in this, yeah, this is on your homework, by the way, and I always do have a test question on this. Giving you a triple point, can you draw the rest of the phase diagram? Now, remember, now this already sounds semi-empirical, right? It is. I'm going to take the derivative of something and reintegrate it, and uh, I know that to build, the, to, to actually get real data, I have to give you a starting point. So that's why I mentioned that previously about um, uh, about colligative properties. Okay, so let's do that. And just like colligative properties and Henry's law and all Rayleigh's law and all that, what I need to do is define equilibrium. And I'm also going to um, uh, so to define these lines. I'm just going to define the lines. The the point there's really nothing you can define. It's just a point. That's the thing I'll give you the triple point. Uh, so to define the lines. I got to, I got to, you know, what, what is the basic thermodynamic principle I would start with? And as we've been doing with colligative properties and, and as we're going to do now, I'm going to start with equal chemical potential, right? If I'm drawing the line, I've got two bases in equilibrium. And so what I'm going to do is start, start with, you know, equal chemical potential. So the phase alpha is a, in equilibrium between beta. We'll do this with just one component, right? That's, my point is I did want you to know this, but I'm not really going to do anything with it because this isn't pretty point. Okay. Now, I also want to walk back into some uh, test two stuff because it's on the final, which is, what, three weeks away now? So I want to remind you of some stuff here. Okay, one is that DG is minus SDT, remember your Legendre transforms, I'm sure I'll have those on the test. That's one of the most important things about this entire class. Actually, I put it on the, uh, I, had, I have to give exams to my grad students, I put that on the test. I also want to remind you that chemical potential is the change in G with respect to N, yeah, T and T, but that's, you know, don't, don't, that's not so important because remember that chemical potentials are all the same uh, whether you're looking at G or H or U or A and all that. Uh, and remember though that because both of these are extensive, you can actually integrate both of them and it's actually equal to the G over N. Again, it's sensible. You know, if you have, uh, if you're buying a widget and you have 100 widgets and you spend $100 and I ask you, well, how much more does it cost to get another widget? You automatically assume it's $1 and you'd be correct, right? So that's what that says. Uh, and again, it's very sensible, but it, it's only true because both of, both of these guys are extensive. Okay, so now again, let's get back to chemical potential. So the change in U. What I'm going to do is talk about the change in U, and then I'm going to basically say that if I get a fluctuation in my chemical potential of my ice cube, it has to be equal to the fluctuation in the chemical potential of, of the water that it's equilibrium with. Uh, basically, they cancel each other out. The chemical potentials, can, changes in chemical potentials cancel each other out. Okay, so uh, now I also want to remind you of what is a basic change of a function. Okay, so I'm starting with temperature, and hopefully I had this on the second test. I think it was the second test. Maybe it was the first test. Uh, that now that I've kept pressure constant, I'm obliged to make that one change. Of course, I'm obliged to keep the other guy constant, so there you go. Now my question is, what exactly is this? What exactly is that? 
again, I'm just, I don't actually need to do this. I just want to remind you of some stuff. Um, and I can clearly tell that uh, it's obviously going to, it looks like it's going to be uh, entropy and volume. Or is it? So uh, let's do this one first. Let's do what's the chemical potential with respect to temperature at constant pressure. What I want to do is uh, remind you what chemical potential is, which I've already written. It's the change in G over the change in N, constant P, constant P. And i got to get my little what's held constant correct. Okay? I want to remind you that uh, OCD, there we go. Now it's perfect. The world won't blow up. Okay, now I want to remind you that Euler's test Right, Euler's. Yeah, Euler's. Remember, I was calling it Euler's criteria. I actually realized that that was a screw up. I looked on Wikipedia. That's some other math here. Euler's test says I can. Sorry about this. I, I can switch these. Um, I can switch the order, and that's because it's exact. Right, and so now I got P, and then uh, a T and P. Okay. Now I got to know. See, once I figure out what this is, this will then hop up here. Just so you remember your math notation. And actually, I know that this is dg dt at constant p. This guy, that's uh, s. Okay. So this ends up being minus s. Change in s with respect to t at constant uh, change. Um, uh, wait, did I? Uh, t? No, with n, with n, with n, right. <laughs> Yeah, sorry, yeah. Yeah, yeah, very, very, God, sorry, sorry, I'm just being an idiot. Uh, I was freaking out because I had change in S with T at constant T. That does not work at all. That's, see, if you write something like that, you screw it up, right? You can't talk about how something changes and hold it constant. If you find yourself doing that on the test, which you just saw me do, then you've done it wrong. Okay, and just like before, just like this, I can do, uh, entropy is extensive, right? More cats is more crazy. <laughs> So this ends up being S per mole, S over N, S per mole. And then uh, normally I go through the whole shebang to do the same thing with um, uh, with pressure, but I won't uh, I won't take up any more time. Um, and this ends up being volume per mole. Okay. Do the same exercise. I'll leave that to you practice for the final. And so what you find is that uh, here I'll toss this up a little second. Let me just write it here. The change in chemical potential is minus S per mole dt plus the volume per mole dp. I know you haven't finished writing that. I'll toss it up here. Uh, it's actually pathetically obvious. I mean, we're in constant temperature pressure land. So chemical potential, I, since I'm in constant TP land, I, I'm always working with G. And so just to go from G to chemical potential, you just divide by one mole, right? And so the, that entropy just becomes entropy per mole. Uh, just one reason I did this was, again, just to remind you of, of all these functions. And uh, I don't want you forgetting them. Um, the last homework, I didn't. I just ran out of room to ask you some way back questions to force you to study. I, I just ran out of room because I wanted to emphasize what was on the third test, which was a little bit difficult because I blew out a couple of spaces on those colligative properties that I already mentioned to you. I, I'm not going to have a uh, calculator question on uh, temperature changes with you know, freezing point depression because it's kind of stupid. Okay, so, um, all right, now, now that I have this, I want to get graphical. And yeah, I'm just going to do this entirely with graphs. I, mean, I could choose a couple ways of doing this, but I have not helped you graph people at all in the last uh, month or so. So, what I want to do is plot chemical potential as a function of temperature, and we'll do water, so I know what some of the points are. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to plot the chemical potential of liquids, solids, and gases, and where they cross will be the parts that define the lines on the phase diagram. And in case you're like, oh wait, I don't remember all that. Just, just hold on. That's the executive summary. Let me, let me just draw this and I'll show you that's true at the end. Okay, now since the change in chemical potential with respect to temperature at constant pressure is the minus S per mole, you see, I'm going to draw these like lines, but I just, you know, what kind of line am I going to draw? Am I going to draw 
a line that's high up or low down? Is it going to point up or is it going to point down? Okay, so I'll ask you this. So I'm going to draw the chemical potential. I'm going to draw it as a line of, of ice, of the solid. Let me ask you this. Should I draw it pointing up or pointing down? What do you think? Down. Right, right. Y, change in Y, change in X, which is the slope, because that's Y and that's X. <coughs> that makes this the slope. The slope is negative because entropies are positive. All right, remember, uh, up and down, now I always obsess with minus signs. This is one reason why. Okay, so I know the line points down, but now I've got to get my intercept. High or low? Okay, now, here's the end. Now, here's how to walk yourself through this. Um, at high temperatures, the liquid will dominate the gas. So that means the chemical potential of the liquid is what? Lower or higher? Higher. Uh, okay, hold on. At higher temperatures, the liquid dominates. Is the chemical potential of the liquid lower or higher? Up there, I heard one of you say it. How left shark? Lower. Right, the chemical potential of the dominant phase is lowest, right? Remember, energy goes downhill, we like negative energies. That the one time that we would say that. Okay, now the point of that is, is that my line needs to start high so that I can draw underneath the liquid so we can undercut it. So the negative, uh, the line is sloping down, I need to start high. Okay, now my liquid is gonna have to undercut it at a higher temperature. All right, so I got that down. But now, what about the slope? It's still negative. Is it more or less negative? But the, does the speed of a liquid, is it greater than that of a solid? Remember the third law? Third law says at zero degrees, a perfect crystal, that's a solid. By definition, a crystal is a solid, has no entropy. So it has more entropy, liquid or the solid? Right, OK, so that means it has a harder slope. OK, so I know a couple of things. I know that at zero degrees that my liquid chemical potential needs to be less than the gas. So there's my starting point. And I know the slope. It's negative, and it's, and it's harder negative. So I'll do that. Now, I don't know if I'm drawing this relatively correct. But anyway, that's the idea. So this is the liquid. OK, there you go. Now, and it's not too hard to imagine what comes next. Uh, at the boiling point, wait, at the boiling point, uh, one more second, at the boiling point, the gas is going to cover the liquid question. Shouldn't gas be, shouldn't that be solid on top? Oh my god, yes, sorry, 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 yeah, right, right, thank you, thank you, thank you. I, uh, I don't I have no idea why I did that. Solid, okay, right, now I'm, now I'm going to do the gas. Okay, now of course I'm not going to bother with the, uh, Holding you guys on this. Obviously, the gas is tremendously high entropy, so its slope is very, very, very down. So, this is the gas. I'm just doing a dotted line um, so that you know that it's not really stable here. There we go. I didn't draw that too well. But anyway, so that's the idea that I have chemical potentials, the lower. The lower chemical potential phase is the dominant one. They will cross, you know, and again, I'm going to do water because you know water melts at zero degrees. You know water boils at 100. And here's why th this works the way it does. Uh, the intercept of the solid is actually the lowest because at low temperature, I have a solid. Right? I just, right, you know that. Hopefully, I said it eloquently. Uh, you know that the liquid has to catch up in a downward way. It has to catch up. Uh, and it will, and so it has to have a greater slope, a greater negative slope, and yada, yada, yada for the gas. Okay, now this is where it gets complicated. Again, I'm going to start building the phase diagram. Now I need to do pressure. So notice what I've done is I've defined where the phase diagram is at one pressure. I did atmospheric pressure because I use atmospheric pressure temperatures for melting and, uh, for melting and boiling. So I've done this at one atmosphere, but now I need to get more pressure data. And once I do this, if I can just create this graph at different pressures, I've got pressure versus temperature data. Now I'm building the phase diagram. All right, I'm going to do that in kind of a bloody, uh, bloody horrible way. 
So what I'm going to do is I'm going to recreate this graph. I'm going to actually make a graph on top of a graph. That's what I'm going to do this. And it, it's kind of awful, yes, but um, what are you going to do? You don't have a choice. OK, so the thing to remember here is that the chemical potential, how does it change with pressure at constant temperature? That's the volume per mole. OK, notice that. When it came to temperature, I have a minus sign. When it comes to pressure, I've got a plus sign. Uh, so what does that mean? Um, it's, it's a little fun here because I have to, I'm going to draw a couple of things at once. So what I want to do is I want to draw some uh, solid lines. And when I increase pressure, when I increase pressure, the lines aren't going to change much. So this is at higher pressure. I'll draw this a bit longer. Sorry. Uh, <coughs> so this is higher, higher pressure. Okay. Higher pressure raises chemical potential. Yeah, remember when we did the osmotic pressure? Adding salt lowered the chemical potential. I had to raise pressure to get it back up to wipe it out, right? Okay. So this is my solid. Uh, yeah, solid, so I better write that. And now I need to do the same with the liquid. And I need to do the same pressure spread. Once I see where the temperatures are, and these lines have defined pressures, I can then plot the, those P's versus T's, so I can build the line, the, the phase diagram. Now here's the thing to note, that uh, I'm going to draw three more, equal, three more equally spaced lines, and they're going to slope downward. And they're going to cross the uh, solid lines, and that's where that's where the ice will melt. But note that <coughs> is the spacing would the spacing be different? What would you expect? Should I draw a wider space between the lines or a smaller spacing? Again, I, I didn't draw these very very widely apart, right? That's, that that means that it's not that's a material that's got a lot of density, right? So it didn't. Um, yeah, yeah, it's it's. It's got a lot of density, so it doesn't. Uh, uh, yes, this number, the volume per mole, uh, that would actually be a small number, right? Because there's not a lot of volume. If you pack a lot of mass in a small volume, that's density. It's kind of messy with you. You kind of want to say the opposite, don't you? Uh, anyway, solids are very dense. Uh, that means the volume per mole is actually kind of small. Uh, remember, this is like one over density, and um, and so that's why I drew the spacing kind of small. What about a liquid? Like wider, wider, right? Liquids are expanded, right? Just like a gas expanded from a liquid. Okay, so I should draw these wider. Now, again, negative sloping, uh, because that delta S thing is still true. See why I need to give myself a little bit of room. Okay, now I can read out the temperature. So I've got P1, T1, and I've got P2, T2, and I've got P3. You know, I'm just reading these off the graph, P3, P3. And what that allows me to do is, see this again, I'm trying to create the phase diagram. And I don't know why I'm mislabeling everything today, P versus T. Uh, again, I've given myself a starting point, which would be the triple point. And what I'm doing is, okay, if uh, this is the solid liquid line, what I'm seeing is that if I'm at a higher temperature, I'm at a higher pressure. Or the way I've done it, if I'm at a higher pressure, I'm also at a higher temperature. That's the equilibrium line. So I'm drawing them like this. OK, so there we go. All right, so notice I'm drawing part of my phase diagram. Note that while I am on solid and liquid, there is a funky one. There, there's, there is an exception to this. So again, this is temperature. I didn't label it, did I? That would be there, whatever. OK. What about water? What's more dense, the liquid or the solid? The liquid is more dense than the solid. Ice floats, right? Now, that's OK. <coughs> Rocks fall to the bottom, unless it's an ice cube, in which case it floats on top. In fact, the Earth would just, we would have no life on Earth if that wasn't true. Uh, because um, I, I saw some geologists figure this out that despite the fact that, of course, the temperature fluctuates between hot and cold, 
if ice dropped to the bottom, it would just collect no matter what, even though you know it still gets hot. Uh, ice would still collect at the bottom of the ocean. It would basically just be full of ice, and it wouldn't be enough to sustain life. I just thought that was a neat little factoid. Okay, in that case, what I need to draw is a wider spacing between the solids at higher pressure, and then less so, less so for the um, uh, for the um, uh, for the liquid. And sorry, I uh, this is really hard to draw. Every time I do this every year, I screw this up because um, this is just a really really awkward graph. So again, the solids, the liquids have to be sharper. <coughs> and let's see what happens. Okay, so um, yeah. here, and I didn't do this right. I didn't do it right. Sorry. My bad, my bad. I, I really struggled with it. This, this is a nightmare thing to draw, by the way. This is the time that I really, really need to consider PowerPoint. So let me do it right. Sorry. The problem was I didn't, I didn't, um, I drew this with too strong a slope. God, don't let me screw it up again. Okay. Uh, that's low pressure. And my green is right. Let's just see what happens. <laughs> Uh, yeah, 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 okay, I did this right. Okay, so here's our lower pressure, here's our intermediate pressure, and here's our high pressure. Okay, I'm kind of bending the lines a bit, but anyway, you get the point. So this is uh, P1, T1, 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 and then this one is P3, T3. Okay, P2, T2, you get the point. Okay. Because of this funkiness in this spacing between the solid being quite wide and the liquid uh, not so much, pressure temperature runs in reverse. So water is a very unusual creature that is solid, is less dense than the liquid. That's actually because it wouldn't be, you know, like my buddy who looked at that liquid jet at very low temperature still be a liquid. We know what the structures of these are by x-ray. And so we have these really powerful x-ray sources at Berkeley and then actually here, 20 uh, minutes away from Argonne National Lab, where we have x-ray sources that can tell us these things. We can look at the structures of solids and liquids. And solids form these big circles. These like, uh, yeah, they form these really, these hollow structures of interconnected, uh, obviously solid, crystalline solid uh, water molecules. They actually spread themselves out a lot. And that's why they tend to be less dense. And uh, that's why on the phase diagram, again, if you go to higher pressure, you actually are at less temperature because of that weirdness to the um, that weirdness with the um, being less dense than ice. Okay, so this is water, and this is everything else. Okay, now. Normally, this is something I would skip if it wasn't water. <laughs> the most important thing, like ever, next to ground itself and the sun, I guess, whatever. Uh, so all of us, all the chemicals a chemist would ever work with, behave this way. But water, being one of very, very few examples of something that does not behave itself, unfortunately, is the one chemical all humans interact with the most. So I'm kind of obliged to draw that. So um, anyway, yeah, that's, that's how these phase diagrams, you may, remember I've been saying when I've been drawing phase diagrams, I always tell you that I'm drawing the water one. It's because I was drawing the uh, solid liquid, I was drawing the solid liquid line sloped to the left, as opposed to everything else, which is sloped to the right. And again, that's why I always said, you probably would have missed it because you didn't think it was a big deal. It was a big deal. I kept saying I was drawing a water-like phase diagram, and that was why. Okay, uh, so now I see graphically how I get these things. And I can do the same thing for the for, um, liquid gas and yada, yada, yada. But tell you what, let's, I, I hope you get the idea of how these work. Right now, I'm trying to think of a way to put this on the test, by the way. I told you this lecture was going to be on the test in terms of a graph question, which I, haven't, I didn't ask one last time, so I feel bad about that. 
I'm kind of thinking about having you play with one of these graphs. Uh, just a heads up. Uh, and now, instead of doing any more graphically, let's actually get more analytical, do a derivation, define the lines, and on your homework, or is it on the exam? I don't remember. I'm kind of just blanking out when it was on here. I got so perturbed this week, I forgot it's on your homework, even though I wrote it, wrote most of it from scratch. Uh, to, so it matches your test a little bit better than it has in years past. Um, so again, what I want to do is I want to actually get mathematical with this. And I'm just going to introduce this and we'll leave a little bit more of the actual math uh, a little bit later. Uh, so how do I define the phase diagram? You know, again, graphs are nice because it gives you the idea that chemical potentials will intersect. Why do they have, why, why does water slope left and everything else slope right? You know, a general understanding. Uh, again, graphs to play with on an exam. But I want hard numbers, and hard numbers the graphs don't provide. So uh, to, to do this, I, I'm going to, again, start with the idea of equal chemical potentials. And I'm going to insert what I just derived, that uh, if I have equal chemical potentials, then the changes in the chemical potentials need to equal. Otherwise, you would not be at equilibrium. The justification for doing this, by the way, is that you have, okay, water and ice, and if you perturb it, but with like a little partial, like a little partial change in temperature, a partial change in pressure, which is a change, but infinitely small, you technically need to still have the ice floating, right? So that's why the chemical potentials and a change in the chemical potential, they both have to be equal or you would not maintain equilibrium. I actually proved this. It takes me an hour to, to show that that is absolutely 100% correct. It takes me nearly an hour and I do it, uh, I do it for my grad students. But hopefully you just take me, a, take me at my word that this is the case. Because uh, I've, I've shown you how chemical potentials have to be equal. And we did a little proof for that. Um, this one I'm just kind of saying, yeah, I just got accepted. But I hope, hopefully it makes sense. So what I'm just writing, writing out is I'm, draw, I'm writing out the change in chemical potential for phase alpha. And I'm telling you that it's got to be equal to the same of phase beta. And it knows everything's per mole. Notice that I didn't qualify T and P. So the uh, entropy and volumes, I, I had to stipulate whether it's alpha or beta because they're not the same. But temperature and pressure, they better be the same because they're intensive variables and we're at equilibrium. Okay, so now what I want to do is isolate. I'm just going to do some childish algebra. Okay, I'm manipulating the volumes. I've got the change in pressure. And now I've got the change in entropies. Now I've got minus beta. So I brought, um, I brought alpha over here. And so minus beta, okay, so that's correct. Okay, you see what I'm doing? I'm, I'm about to build a slope. I'm about to define the PT slope. So next step, um, the PDT, sorry, I'm not using the board so great today. You see, I've developed, I've developed a, um, I, I figured out what the slope is. And without saying, it's the change in entropy per mole divided by the change in volume per mole. So, um, and this is, again, this is DPDT. What this is, I told you I would draw the phase diagram, the general phase diagram, a zillion times. I'll draw like this or like this, you know. Which is it, which is it? Um, again, P versus T, I've got the slope, so if I just give you a starting point, you can now build the rest of the lines. Let's also see where water is different. Uh, where water is different is that the change in volume going from solid to liquid is actually negative, right? Most things it's positive, but in the, in the case of water, it's negative. That's why it slopes to the left and not to the right like a normal line. Okay, now what we'll do next time, uh, remember please get your homework is, I'm going to actually bring the dt over and integrate it with the lower part, the lower limit being the triple point 
and you're going to be able to build the line from there. And what we're going to do with that, by the way, just before you go, I'm going to tell you one thing we're going to do with it. NASA recently claimed that there's liquid water on Mars. Right, you knew that? You didn't know that, right? They did. They lied. They lied. I was actually shocked. As soon as they announced it, I knew they lied. You are going to prove that NASA lied it is part of this class. There cannot be liquid water on Mars. It is impossible. You're going to show that next time.